Hi everyone and welcome to this Women at Cult podcast in conversation with Claire Limbert. My name is Shuba Tobias and I am your host for today. On the 23rd of June, we celebrate International Women in Engineering Day. The day gives women engineers around the world a profile when they are still hugely underrepresented. This day plays a vital role in encouraging more women and girls to take up engineering careers. To mark this day, we are talking to one of Colt's most senior women engineers, Claire Limbert. Claire Limbert is our Vice President of Network Operations. She joined Colt in 2021 as Director of Transformation and was promoted to VP at the beginning of 2023. In today's podcast, episode one, we cover Claire's non-traditional career story so far. Claire shares with us the challenges she's faced along the way and her career highlights so far. Hi, Claire. How are you? I'm really well, thanks, Shuba. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much for joining us on this special podcast. Um, I wanted to start really actually at the beginning um, and speak a little bit about your time at university. So what did you study and why? So I did a history degree um, specializing in medieval history, um, which is perhaps not the most obvious choice for somebody with a, in a technical career. But I picked it because I was just fascinated by trying to look at all these different bits of data and really trying to understand what had happened using a variety of different sources and then and then use those to form a narrative to allow me to draw a conclusion and i also really liked the way that you see echoes of the past influence what happens in the present and being able to draw those connections between what was going on in in the news today and and linking it back to the sort of historical events that really have driven those And and I think the other piece of it was I was always interested in people and their motivations. And you you get an insight or lots of different people's views on um, key figures in the past. So that piece was quite interesting as well, just seeing how the people, the different things people focused on, um, what they considered to be important, not important, how they chose to tell the story. So all of those things led me to to study history. That's amazing. And during your time, what did you, you know, what did you think your career would look like, or what did you think your next job would be whilst you were um, studying the history degree? Well, initially, I think when I started, I thought, well, I'll, I'll go on, I'll do a PhD and further study, and then I'll go into research, or I'll, or I'll teach, or I'll, I'll be involved in somewhere in the profession. But I think as I drew towards the end of my final year, I realised that I wanted to change. And I didn't actually know what my what my next opportunity would look like because there was a big world out there and I hadn't really, I'll be honest, I hadn't really got a plan. And so what I looked for was um, what they called at the time fast track graduate management schemes, because I thought that would give me a basic insight into business. And so I applied for a number of those. And my first job was actually with WH Smith News Distribution. Um, working in uh, working in logistics, figuring out how to get newspapers and magazines from publishers in London distributed around the UK in time for people to pick them up at seven in the morning to have with their cup of coffee and their breakfast. And that was really interesting because it, it gave us it gave me an insight into all aspects of a business from logistics to customer service to finance to admin. To, um, to to sales to marketing, um, and I think you know, and I think what that took from what I took from that was really that you know, so it was a good grounding. But the bit that I enjoyed most was when I got invited into a business process review program, where I got an opportunity to look at everything WH Smith News did document all their processes literally on a brown piece of paper which stretched around you know sort of two sides of a sports hall and then work out where there was inefficiency in that process and where there were opportunities to improve and and since then I've been fascinated fascinated really in taking that thought further and looking at how do we do things how can we simplify them and how can we make them better amazing and how long was um 
your job with uh, WH Smith, how long was the grad scheme there? So the grad scheme was about 18 months. And at the end of that, I decided, that, and at the end of that, I was offered a job as a customer service manager, managing a team of 12 people in their new, what they call their news house in Cambridge. Um, I made the decision that I didn't want to stay in sort of in that in that company. I wanted to explore further. So I took the I took what I'd learned from there and I went to work for Accenture and I went to work in their business process re-engineering team um, based at the London Stock Exchange, um, where I got to see a different business. And this is really where I got my first taste of networks because I started off in their in their networking department looking and again it was looking at their business as usual processes, um, understanding how their networks worked, what their customers needed from them. And from there, I went into, um, I actually took a secondment into application design and helped re-engineer some of the, the code that they were using to, um, to look at, to manage their customer communications more effectively. And so, and I did that for two years and then I got offered a, an opportunity to go into project management in a, an ISP called UUNet, which was then, which I, and I ended up staying there for about 20 years. Um, so that it was bought by a company called it, Wellcom, which became a company called MCI, which became a company called Verizon. And over that 20 year period, I always worked within operations, but I did a huge range of jobs within that. Um, everything from sort of network planning to um, network optimization to service delivery um, to um, sort of managing finance to staff management to process improvement to major customer rollouts and and eventually I became a director for Western Europe for the operations team for service delivery and for service delivery field engineering and um, outside plant um, and from there I came to Cult. Amazing. You just summarised that really well. Um, if we go back a little bit to your first taste of tech, really, what was what was your biggest hurdle that you faced at that time coming from, you know, a non-traditional STEM background um, and then launching into this job where you're dealing with networks and technology? I think the biggest challenge has been the language um, because te the technical language is very different. And so there's a lot of terminology that you have to use. There are a lot of different ways of saying the same thing. Um, so I think it was and being able to translate the sort of technical details into something that you can then explain to somebody with a non-technical background was always was always a challenge. And so, you know, I've always learned on the job and I've I've learned from the people around me and I've gained a lot of experience through that way. Um but I think that was the initial challenge was having that first, you know, first in you know, at the deep end experience of, of this is what, you know, networks look like. This is what's important for this network. And then finding that obviously there were common elements that each subsequent technology and, and network that I needed to learn about had. But there's always a nuance and a different way of um, different way of configuring, a different way of designing, um, but also different language that's used around naming conventions, et cetera. And it, it's learning all of those and making sure that you you can communicate that in a clear way. I think that's a really valuable skill. What was it like joining a predominantly male sector as a young grad? So I suppose I never really thought about it, but there were probably only two or three women out of a team of 40 or 50. Um, we were all there to do a job. The environment itself was really exciting because the industry was young and it's you know, so there's so much change all the time and so so much growth in that area and there was always something new to learn and something new to do. And and that's something that's always appealed to me. Um, but, you know, when I think back, I think I probably was one of the few women in that sort of environment at that time. And that was that was even more the case when I worked for when I worked for Accenture. There were very few people in the net for new women in the like, in the networking team at all. Um, but I think the environments are very inclusive. I think the, um, I think people were very supportive. I had some really good, um, really good sort of mentors and guides through to help me through the process. And and I think showing that I was willing to learn and I was willing to take responsibility helped 
me to grow, but also helped other people to gain confidence in in my ability to meet their needs. It's all about proving your ability and not letting imposter syndrome get in the way. Now for a big question. What would you say has been the biggest highlight in your career so far? <laughs> so tricky. So I think, oh, there's so many to choose from. I mean, there were some there was, there was a major program that I worked on years ago, which I think was a highlight. It was delivering an enormous customer network. And it was, you know, sort of really cutting edge. We were working in an environment where we were still developing the systems internally that we needed to support the customer externally. We had to think really laterally about how we were going to do this at scale and at speed. And it was difficult, but re- but also a really positive experience. And I think the best thing about that experience was the way different people from across the business came together to support one another. And that's that culture of of really sort of looking at looking at problems, looking at but looking at figuring out together how to solve them, and and helping one another with with combined expertise, as opposed to going as opposed to thinking about it more in silos. And I think, you know, that that's something that I still see now. You know, although I see it, I see it um, in my current role when when our team comes together, when we've got a major, you know, if we've got a major issue, it's it's amazing to watch how people solve it together. And the the amount of support that people give one another, and the commitments that they make to you know to one another and to our customers to to actually get a good resolution. So, and I think I think that's when I'm you know so those are the highlights for me when I really see people at their best and you know so and doing what they need to do and going that extra mile to to make amazing things happen. How do you think the workplace has changed since joining WH Smith and Accenture to being the vice president of network operations at Colt? And what are some of the changes you've seen for women in engineering? I think I think not just for women, but I think generally the workplace is, is much more inclusive than it was when I when I first started working. Um I think people I think I think sort of you know, my experience of 20 years ago when I, well, more than 20 years ago now when I when I started working is that people were very focused on process and output, um, but it was less about understanding people and, you know, appreciating the value of diversity, and I mean all kinds of diversity and that, and, and thinking about and connecting on a much more human level. Um, one of the things that I have noticed over the years is that authenticity and that ability to be yourself is more and more important and I think is something that has been increasingly valued through my career um, is that and that that makes a big difference if you don't fit the sort of traditional conventional model for what does a leader look like um, it allows people to play to their strengths, to adapt their own leadership styles to what works for them. And it creates opportunities for people who perhaps don't look like or sound like or behave quite like the people who came before them. Um, so I think, you know, that I think is a major change. I think also the focus more on you know, work-life balance has really changed the dynamic and sort of a the, the greater level of respect that we now have for people. Um, sort of thinking about where they work and when they work and how they work. And that in itself has also allowed us to bring much more talent and different talent into our businesses. And I think that's made a huge difference in the engineering space. And it's made it, it's made it more accessible, I think, to more people. I think that's really important. And even in my short time at Cole, I've seen that authenticity and how much value that can bring to an organization if, you, if people are free to be themselves. Looking back now, what's the one piece of advice you would give your younger self as a graduate about to embark on the world of work? I think I would tell myself to take more risk than I have. I've I've been one of historically one of those people that's that's you know tried to prove my worth by demonstrating what I can do, and maybe not you know maybe there have been times in my career where I didn't step out of my comfort zone enough and challenge myself enough. And I've been really fortunate in that I've had very um, supportive managers who pushed me and have helped me get to where, you know, and it's those people that really gave me the additional opportunities to help me to get to where I am today. 
And my big takeaway is that I could have done more myself if I'd had a bit more confidence. And instead of thinking, you know, if I go for this job and I get it and I fail, what do I do? I should have been thinking I should go for this job because it's going to help me to grow. And if I'm chosen for it, people won't let me fail because they've picked me because they think I'm the right person and they want me to be successful. And I, and I think just by turning that, you know, sort of turning that thought around, it, it opens up doors that, that perhaps you, you close yourself. I think there was a period probably in my career where I was probably my own worst enemy in terms of holding, holding my own career back because I wasn't, I wasn't brave enough. And that's, that's something that I have, you know, really reflected on and is something that I've positively changed. And it's also a message that, you know, I, I try and share with other people because there's so many opportunities out there that isn't one right route and there isn't one right route all the time. You have to take the opportunities that are coming to you and, and use them to grow, even if it wasn't exactly the thing that you were originally looking for. That's great advice. And I think it will really resonate with many people listening. The final question for me is, what are your tips in helping build that confidence, especially when early on in your career? So I think ask for feedback. And if somebody gives you feedback, whether it's good or whether it's bad, then accept it. Um, feedback's a gift. It depends very much, you know, you can choose how you want to use that and where you, you know, how you choose to apply that. But it's always really important to get other people's perspectives on how you're doing. Um, also, I'd say look out for those people. There are people along every career path who can help you. Um, you know, it's something that I feel quite strongly about is the importance of, of finding the right mentors, um, finding the right coaches. If you're lucky enough to attract a sponsor, finding a right sponsor. Um, I'm very conscious of the fact, you know, when I when I picked mentors to support me, I deliberately picked people who didn't think like me and who didn't work in the part of business that I worked in because I wanted people to give me a completely different perspective. Because I thought, because I felt that was really valuable, valuable, and it's also a good way of if you feel like there are certain gaps or areas you feel less confident in, it's a good way of exploring those and and helping to and helping to close some of those. Or well, just use your network to to get to know what other people do and to to get to know other parts of your business is a great way to grow. Thank you so much, Claire, for sharing your pearls of wisdom with women at Colt and our listeners today. The second instalment of this conversation will be available next week and we will be speaking to Claire about the impact of mentoring and sponsorship. Thanks for listening. This one-off series to celebrate International Women in Engineering Day was brought to you by Women at Colt. Our vision is to promote diversity and gender balance at Colt and engage with all employees to enable Colt's women to thrive.